The Lord be with you. This morning we have the pleasure of a baptism in the Logis family, and we're looking forward to that after the opening liturgy. Uh, Jillian's family, the Coxes, are here with us, and we have their sponsors as well. So today's theme is going to be based on the gospel reading. It's called the parable of the weeds. And there, Jesus talks about a harvest that is yet to come and the importance of there being time so that the harvest can be full and that sinners have opportunity to repent and be gathered together in the Lord's kingdom. And so our theme in the sermon is to explore that parable of the weeds and to see about God's omniscient patience toward his people. Our opening hymn today is number 809, Great is Thy Faithfulness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. 
Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your just and righteous decrees. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high and on earth peace, good will toward man. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee. We glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, O only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost. I, in the glory of God the Father, The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that being ever mindful of your final judgment, we may live holy here and dwell with you hereafter. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, One God, 
now and forever. You may be seated. I would now invite the congregation to please turn to page 268. Page 268 for the order of holy baptism. And I now invite our baptism family forward to the font. Can you take the lid? Can you take the lid? Thank you. Today we have Kevin and Jillian Logis along with their son Ian. And Avery, their daughter, is sitting among them, in, among family in the pews. And uh, it's a great gift to be able to present our children to the Lord, that the Lord himself might speak through his Holy Spirit and claim this child as his own for temporal care in this world and eternal care in heaven forever. Let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter is written, Baptism now saves you. The Word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. How is your child to be named? Ian James. Ian James Logis, receive the sign of the Holy Cross over your forehead and over your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. A prayer that Martin Luther wrote helps us understand the connection of God saving his people through the promise in his word along with the visible sign of water. We now bow our heads as we pray the flood prayer. Almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea. You led your people Israel through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of your holy baptism. Through the baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold Ian according to your boundless mercy and bless him with true faith by the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood, All sin in him which has been inherited from Adam and of which he himself will commit since would be drowned and die. Grant that he be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, being separated from the multitude of unbelievers. 
and serving your name at all times with a fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, he would be declared worthy of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our sponsors today are Brady Teeman and Bridget Boland. We recognize from ancient times that the church has observed the custom of appointing sponsors for baptismal candidates and catechumens. In the Evangelical Lutheran Church, sponsors are to confess the faith in the Apostles' Creed and taught in the small catechism. They are, whenever possible, to witness the baptism of those they sponsor. They are to pray for them, support them in their ongoing instruction, and nurture in the Christian faith and encourage them toward the faithful reception of the Lord's Supper. They are, at all times, to be examples to them in the holy life of faith in Christ and love for the neighbor. Brady and Bridget, is it your intention to serve as sponsors in the Christian faith? May God enable you to will and do this good service in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We hear now the gospel according to St. Mark. They brought young children to Jesus that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. As in baptisms of the early church, so we continue the practice of praying the prayer our Lord Jesus has taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May the Lord preserve your coming in and your going out, both now and forevermore. Amen. As we heard in the opening liturgy, that we are all born into the sinful condition since the time of Adam and Eve, and under the power of the devil, I ask you as his parents, do you renounce the devil and all of his works and all of his ways? At this time, rather than just asking them the questions, we as a congregation will confess the faith into which this child is baptized. I invite you to turn to the inside back cover of your hymnal. And we speak together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now return to page 270. Kevin and Jillian, do you desire that your son be baptized? If so, say yes. Okay. 
Ian James Logis. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, and forgives you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace unto life everlasting. Amen. Okay. Ian is clothed in a white garment, which is appropriate because it symbolizes the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was without sin, being imputed unto us through the very act that our Lord Jesus gave, holy baptism. So as God looks upon us as the baptized, he sees us redeemed and pardoned. And as God looks at Ian, he sees him as pardoned and redeemed. I now ask you to please bring the light here. Christ Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. And all of us are called to no longer walk in the darkness, but to walk in the light. So baptism is the beginning of a whole life of discipleship, which you have already begun. Discipleship means obedience to his word, learning his word, and partaking of his gifts in worship. And as time goes on, our Lord Jesus Christ will bring light into his darkness and be his guide, for we hear that God's word is a light for our path. I don't know what he's saying to me. The Lord is good, and he has brought another new child into God's kingdom. And so, let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you graciously preserve and enlarge your family, and have granted Ian the new birth in holy baptism making him a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as he has now become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace, and according to your good pleasure, he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven, Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. So we have baptismal certificates for the two of you. You may now put out the candle. And we now return to our seats. Let us bless the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, what does this mean? With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true Father and that we are his true children, so that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children, ask their dear Father. Today's Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah chapter 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. 
Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No. Lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Having already confessed a creed, we can be seated, and we join in our sermon hymn number 892. Hearing the scriptures is one of the most important things that you can do. As we listen to what is spoken by God, we hear how he unveiled himself by talking with Adam and Eve. And God gave them land, water, trees, every kind of vegetation for food. There was no sin in the garden, nor death. So the presence of God was here. Even though Adam and Eve were hearing God's voice, in time, they heard another. An enemy came and asked them a question. Did God actually say, followed by this enemy casting doubt about the boundaries that God had given and about his promise to care for them. The enemy didn't care at all about Adam and Eve. Out of his own evil nature, he was defying God, and his intent was to disrupt the peace that was in the garden. Adam and Eve fell from grace that day, and this is the reason. Instead of giving ear to the Lord... They gave ear to another voice. The result was for the first time, doubt entered their world. 
along with disillusionment. What have I done? And why am I this way now? Death was suddenly a visible reality. Though they couldn't comprehend it yet, they were told, you will now die. When they listened to the Lord, they had been safe in his kingdom, secure, knowing that God, their creator, was also their sustainer. But now this world shows decay. And now there is discord between themselves. And there are weeds that begin to grow right alongside all of the good plants. This is the world we now live in, that we see with all of its decay, with all of its discord, and with the weeds growing among us. And the cause of it? An enemy did this. All of us, since Adam and Eve, have been listening to another voice telling us that we're independent, telling us to listen to our own conscience, encouraging us to be a little bit rebellious for the sake of being your own person. And yet behind all of those voices is only one enemy tempting us to ask the same age-old question. Did God really say, has God, the creator of the universe, really spoken? The result of insisting on we're independent is our disobedience toward God. We are responsible for all of our sins, and we know that the whole of our life, it is our fault, our own most grievous fault, and we understand having had responsibility, transgressed for the sake of our own choice, and that due to our sin, we have caused hardship and heartache to others. We know that we have been made to listen to God's voice because he wants to protect us and he wants safe boundaries for us as his people that we might be holy and separate from a world that is headed towards decay. And yet we keep entertaining all of these other voices, believing that they are harmless to listen and follow them in addition to believing in the Lord's care. We insist that our own inside voice is not sinful, but in our modern language we say, I'm independent, not sinful. Yet our Lord is persistent with you, understanding the nature of you living in a fallen world and he is still speaking to you through his word, offering an invitation to come higher. If we're willing, we will come to prefer his still, small voice. There's something restorative about the promises that are given to us from God, that he can bring peace even while we're in turmoil, and we hold to that. And, the idea that God is nurturing you like a plant that he is responsible for. That during certain seasons of disobedience, he didn't crush you, but rather patiently waited for you to turn and receive his favor again. There was a day when Jesus went out to sit by the sea. We heard about this in the gospel reading today. A few people arrived to hear him speak, and he was talking about the kingdom of God. More and more people arrived, so many that they surrounded Jesus, and they were hearing him teach the scriptures. Notice that they were giving ear to the Lord. Just like today, with us coming to church in order to hear and repent those people recognized a need to hear a better voice and adjust their lives 
to God's call. Their lives were like ours, including both blessing and hardship. Disease would rob them of years, and disease would even afflict those who were young. People lived in fear of soldiers who were patrolling the area and could be harsh. Walking at night or on a trail was risky because you might get assaulted. Some years, the plantings would bring a good harvest, and other years, when the weather didn't cooperate, individuals really knew hunger. During Jesus' time, there was rape and incest, the misuse of the body in sexual experience outside of marriage. There was murder and cheating and dishonesty. So Jesus knew why these people had come out to see him by the sea. They wanted to know, where is God while I have to suffer through my lot? And they wanted to know, what should we do about those people who are making our lives hard? And what is God going to do about the situations that we are having to live through right now? And so Jesus spoke with authority and he counseled patience, letting them know their situation that they're experiencing right now would not change. Not until the Son of Man returns. But he counsels them while they're in their affliction that they can know peace when they turn their hearts in prayer toward the Father, He is still there. He is listening. And He abides with us while we face those things that we would never wish upon anyone. Jesus told them a parable. That the kingdom of God is like a man who sowed his field with good seed, but an enemy came and sowed bad among the good. As time goes on, all of the plants are coming up, but the weeds are also taking nutrients of the soil, and they are hindering the growth of the good plants. Some want to just yank out the weeds, but the farmer counsels patience. Let the weeds grow among the wheat, because the weeds are now enmeshed and both might be destroyed if you attack the weeds. Wait until the harvest. Let the reapers separate the weeds from the wheat. The crowd listening by the sea had plenty to think about, just as we would have questions too. What should we do then? Just wait and watch the situation fall apart? Shouldn't we address evil? Shouldn't we, when we see something bad, stop it from going on? Jesus is counseling them to think through what they do before rashly assuming that they can just yank out evil and there won't be any other consequences. He's reminding them who the enemy is, someone more powerful than they realize. Satan planted those weeds, and his intention is to destroy the entire harvest. If they react out of fear of Satan, it'll probably go badly, and they will destroy the good plants too. Martin Luther had something to say about how evil might be overcome. He also recognizes that bad is mixed with good and no one can change it. Yet he's also confident that God's Spirit is at work when His people counsel lovingly and show those who are in sin their error, asking them to repent in the name of Jesus Christ with the intention that they might be restored they might be forgiven. In this way, a good plant might be tended to 
and either any further harm that the person might experience might be prevented. Luther says that when we speak the truth in love, we are trusting Christ. We know that Christ never fails his people. And Christ went to those who were lost in sin and was patient and listened and offered them eternal life. We pray to Jesus, who is greater than Satan, that the Lord might work repentance in the heart of someone who is being tempted away. Isn't it possible for a person to be changed after receiving mercy? Christ is bigger than every situation, even those that we have just said, this is hopeless, this is unredeemable. They are separate and perhaps condemned, and we have nothing to give them. Our Lord Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, still remains alive to hear their prayers and to receive them back in due time. So the disciples asked Jesus to explain further the parable of the weeds. He said, the one who sows good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. We're hearing from Jesus that those who have faith in God listen to his voice, and they are truly the children of his kingdom. This life doesn't have to be perfect in order for them to see that God is good and that he continues to care for them. Those who listen to other voices, think that God is distant or non-existent. They describe God as something other and perhaps even helpless due to the suffering of the world that they see. And in order to substitute faith in God, they create new false hopes. How is it? that so many in our world today can choose which history they'll believe and relegate other historical events to be improbable or fiction or false. It seems to be the case regarding Jesus Christ. The account of his life is public, and it was acknowledged by historians of the time. His healings were verified by thousands upon thousands who received his touch and change. Jesus was crucified under the governance of Pontius Pilate. And the details of all of his preaching, his arrest, trial, and execution are well preserved. The resurrection of Jesus was a matter of historical record. And the preaching of the early church was founded on that one event. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is in vain. And we should be pitied for believing it. So the reason for people disbelieving facts like this is an enemy has done that. Satan has sown seeds of doubt from the beginning, causing men and women to ask, did God really say any of that? And what does it matter anyway? As modern people, there's a temptation to think, what you see is what you get. And there isn't anything after we die. They even reject simple history and claim that anything that pertains to Jesus Christ is just yesterday and has no bearing on today. That is the result of the enemy sowing weeds among the wheat. And so many will keep Jesus Christ at arm's length so as not to be seen as dependent on anyone. Not even really believing that God made them. I am my own. I'll live my life. And I'll die. 
and whatever comes, comes. And yet, with that independence, they create other voices. They listen to other fictions. And they have a philosophy. And yet it renders nothing towards sin and the fault of our collective sins and how has it affected others. They remain in a state of unrighteousness and unable to prove worth. There is no hope for eternal life through the fictions that some are believing in. We who are in Christ pray for them. We pray that they might be willing to give ear to God's word and receive an invitation to something that is lasting. They might come to see Jesus Christ as good and that Jesus Christ may in fact have risen from the dead and is now mindful of them. We pray for the Holy Spirit to help them breathe in faith and they might relax and entertain the idea, maybe God did make me and maybe I am a good plant after all. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which is beyond our understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand for prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and live. Hear our prayers for those outside the church. Take away their iniquity and turn them from their false gods to you, the living and true God. Gather them into your holy church to the glory of your holy name. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you would have all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. By your power and by your unsearchable wisdom, we ask that you break and hinder every counsel of those who hate your word and those who by corrupt teaching would destroy and doubt your word. Enlighten them with the knowledge of your glory that they may know the riches of your heavenly grace and that they too are called to be clothed with Christ our Son. Lord, in your mercy, Lord Jesus Christ, you commanded holy baptism and you empowered this great sacrament with your word and promise that in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we might be changed. 
We thank you for the living faith in the Logis and Cox families, and we pray that Ian and Avery would continue to grow in their baptismal faith now until life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the Largent family at the death of Charlie Largent, and we pray for compassion for all those who still mourn the death of loved ones. And yet we are not as those who have no hope. Christ is risen and declares that all who are baptized into his name and believe shall share in his resurrection. We look forward to the day of final harvest when we shall all see you face to face. Lord, in your mercy, Christ Jesus, you healed all who were brought to you, changing them in their bodies that they might know a new strength that they had not before. So we pray for new strength and healing for Cindy Engelman, Ellen Collier, Paula Rogers, Gary Mattis, Helen Pragman, Linda Sanders, Mike Bodenstab, Deb Jones, Debbie Rebusell, Donna Underwood, Phyllis Schramm, Elda Denning, Deaconess Sarah, Nancy Carson, Bev Miller, Vanessa Burmeister, Lori Kepsel, Bob Timms, Joan Bandy, Wayne Martin, Cindy Eaton, Ron Dompsch, Patty Ott, Bill McLean, Braden Rohner, Ruth Weinrich, Melvin Steffens, Tracy Redman, Carter Young, Maria Redman, and Caden Sheets. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend them and ourselves into your care. We trust in your love toward us and your patience toward us. We pray that we would live lives in the light of your word, anticipating the day of your return. Keep us steadfast in faith and in your word until we see you coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue now with the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who out of love for his fallen creation, humbled himself taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. O Christ, the love of God, that takest away sin.
we stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen the salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all peoples. Love to light in the Gentiles and the glory of thy people in Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace.
In the month of June, in our St. Matthew newsletter, I included a single sheet that is a funeral preparation worksheet. It gives you the opportunity to perhaps write down some scriptures that give you hope, or particular hymns that have always spoken faith to you and given you the assurance of eternal life. I'll be reprinting that sheet again soon and making those available. Quite a few people actually filled them out with some hymn suggestions and returned them to me. I mention it today because I myself began scratching a few things down on the funeral planning worksheet. Not that I think anything's imminent, it's just that I thought it would be good to be able to have that in my Bible or in my file here at church. And so, may Jesus Christ be praised. The song that we just sang is one of my choices for my funeral whenever that day might come. Because I want my funeral not to be about me, but about Jesus Christ. And something that is uplifting and hopeful. That all my people would be able to say, may Jesus Christ be praised in the good and in the hard. God still wins the day. I do have a few other announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, we pray for God's blessings for the Logis and Cox families and uh, for your safe travel that you've been able to be here and returning home. Uh, we do have another baptismal chest, a faith chest. Since Avery probably has one from a few years ago, we also have one for Ian. Uh, next week... In worship, we're going to be having a dedication of altar furnishings. We still have the former altar furnishings here, and our candelabra have been a little bit wobbly and shaky over 30 years. So we've purchased new candelabra, and we've purchased new banner stands that are going to be the same height, and we've purchased some new banners. So at all three worship services next week, we'll have the opportunity to dedicate the new altar furnishings to the glory of God. There are two Bible classes I'd like to mention. The first is right down the hallway after we conclude worship. I'm still talking about the history of the Christian church. And today... Our topic is the call of God upon a person's life. How some people in reading scripture felt that they needed to set themselves apart in meaningful ways in order to serve their neighbor and serve God. So we're looking at the period of monasticism from about 800 to 1000 and what monastic life was like. So it'll be an interesting Bible study for us. And then on Wednesday night, I continue my class on Lutheran teachings, and we'll look at how we use God's Word to know how to respond to all the things that are happening in culture around us. It ought to be an interesting study as we look at contemporary issues and how we as Lutheran Christians remain prayerful throughout a society that is falling apart in many respects. So that's Wednesday at 7 p.m. I think those are my only announcements. You have an announcement? Okay. Are there other announcements? Yes, sir. An abundance of cucumbers and zucchini. Pick it up freely in the narthex. May Jesus Christ be praised.
sir. God bless you. God bless you, brother.